Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Protests and demonstrations have broken out across the United States following the murder of George Floyd on May 25th. George Floyd was killed by police officers with one of them actually placing his knee on his neck for nearly nine minutes. In the aftermath, these protests have demanded justice, they have demanded systemic change, they have demanded an end to police racism. To talk more about this, we have with us Claudia de la Cruz of the Popular Education Project and the People's Forum in New York. Thank you so much, Claudia, for talking to us. And thank you so much, Prasant, and the People's uh, Dispatch for inviting me. Yes. So to begin with, uh, one of the key things many people are mentioning on the streets as well as uh, people who have been raising these issues in movements for a long time is the fact that this is definitely not just one isolated incident. This is not a case of a couple of, I think you yourself have mentioned, this is not a case of a couple of rotten apples in, in a police force in one city in the country. This is really a systemic issue. There have been a number of such murders, such executions in the past and the trend nonetheless keeps continuing. And there have been a number of movements also. People in power have expressed words of sympathy. They have made calls of vague slogans for change but nothing has happened. So could you talk a bit about the systemic factors and how they play into this, especially when it comes to law enforcement? I mean, I think it's important to understand and, and you bring up uh, the point of it being systemic. I mean, historically, when we think about surveillance, when we think about policing and militarization, we're thinking about what's at the core and at the roots of, of the development of the United States of America. Um, to think about it as an individual case is a complete loss, um, not only for our movements, but in general for our people. Um, it's, it, it creates... Um, disadvantage in us understanding how evil, how brutal, how um, demonic the system can be to protect capital and protect property and protect the elite. Um, historically, we've seen the murder of black and brown bodies of poor people, um, including poor whites throughout, you know, um, the, the years and state sanctioned violence. You know, it's important to understand that this is as, as American as apple pie, you know, it, it continues to happen. Um, I think the difference now is that it is something that's being documented and it's something that is being put out for the world to see. And this particular case of, of George Floyd um, brought up a lot of indignation because he's not the first one to have been killed in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> he's one of, of many folks who have been killed, some of which we know and some of which we don't know, um, not only by police, but also by vigilantes that have been um, you know, in, in many ways supported by the state that have been given a slap in the wrist um, and, and, you know, very, very uh, soft measures, if anything, have been taken to pacify the people and the people are fed up, you know, um, even, in, even the judgment of how people choose to express and rebel themselves um, and, and the, the narrative you know, when you have the president of the United States talk about black and brown and poor people as thugs and calls the mayor of Minnesota a loose lefty on Twitter um, and says, I'm going to send the National Guard to take care of this in the right way. Like you see that uh, white supremacist, classist um, way of approaching, you know, people's pain and people's mourning. There's more concern for the burning of buildings and the killing of people, you know. Um, and so it's, it's clear that, that, that the people of the United States, the people that are in the streets, that are making the streets burn right now, are, are fed up, you know, and that they understand that it's not a matter of the nine minutes that it took for that cop, for Chauvin, to put his knee on George Floyd's neck. It's beyond that. It's beyond those nine minutes is the 400 years plus of this type of state sanctioned violence. Right. So one of the key questions that has come out, like you pointed out, is that uh, there have been protest movements coming out. There have been many instances of protests in the past as well. The most uh, important instance being after the killings at Ferguson. So one of the key questions many people are looking, especially from across the world, is how do these protests develop? What are the kind of demands that, that are being put forward? And it's still the very early days, especially yesterday saw the protests really spreading to many, many cities across the country. So right now, could you tell us a bit about what are some of the key aspects that are being raised? 
I mean, I think for the most part, and when you see the news clips, when you when you engage with the people on the ground, when you talk to people in the different cities and people coming out, the the most pressing uh, piece and demand is, you know, criminal uh, criminal. Uh, uh, cr criminal response to criminal actions like third degree murder is not enough for someone who yeah. who who killed on, in, someone in cold blood um it, for the world to see you know it was a public lynching so people the first demand is that if the criminal justice system does not take it upon themselves to um you know hold police officers to the same standard as regular citizens this will continue to happen and 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 historically it's proven you know um it hasn't worked for them to talk about community and police relationships when these cops continue to brutalize and murder our people and they do not receive the same type of you know treatment than than someone who would kill a white person or will kill a cop Right? It's not the same. The value of life is not the same. So that's the first demand. I think there are a lot of people also in, in the more um, leftist movements that are calling for the ab abolition of prisons and the abolition of policing, right? Um, that are calling for community policing and different ways in which people are able to, you know, be protected. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, because it also needs to be said, um, th there's a level of disorganization from grassroots movements and the left in the United States. There's a lot of fractions. Um, it's very fragmented. And therefore, it's very difficult to say that there is a, a, a very clear political demand that is unifying and that folks are all at once kind of coming with this list of demands. Um, I think it's a good start, you know, and I think what we need to learn from previous uh, rebellions, from previous revolts, is how do we position ourselves um, in relationship, in support, in uplifting, in strengthening you know, the, the cry of, of our people in a way that makes sense and advances, you know, the, the, the political agenda that says we're here to defend life, we're here to defend, you know, community, we're here uh, from an anti-capitalist perspective, from an anti-imperialist perspective, that's work, you know, that folks that have some sort of level of organization that are part of organiz uh, organizations um, from the from the left and folks that, that have much more of uh, uh, class consciousness, you know, uh, that's that's the work that that we need to be invested in. And unfortunately, um, I say that, but I also say that there's a lot of fragmentation, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of differences in terms of how do we conceive moving forward. You know, we're in a different place than we were um, in Ferguson in Baltimore in in 2014. People people have gone through Obama. We survived Obama. You know. Um, we've, we've survived Ferguson, we've survived Baltimore, we've gone through four years of Trump, the, the increased aggression of the United States internationally and the extractivism, the, you know, the increasing militarization of police, um, the assault on the immigrant populations, we've gone through all of that. And now we're in the midst of a global pandemic you know, so we're in a different space. The, the people of the United States in, in, in a different space, so much so that there, there were over 15 cities that were burning last night and people have taken on, you know, to push back on the narrative of riots, you know, and saying that these are revolts and these are revolts from the very historical point of view and understanding that the revolt is the voice and language of those who are oppressed. You know, and that they have the right to do that, and that their their righteous anger is what will move this country. And so I think it's a great a, a great opportunity in in many ways for us to be able to advance our struggles if we have the courage to walk side by side and, and be in in that struggle, um, and 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 take this opportunity to build the working class organizations that will ultimately move us to another political and, and social uh, reality. And I guess a key challenge also would be the fact of that there's an election year, there is a risk and the temptation of it being framed entirely around Trump. And while obviously his statements have been extremely violent, they have been abusive, nonetheless, this is not really a Republican versus Democrat issue at all. 
you're totally right. It's not a partisan. <laughs> it's not a partisan thing. Both Democrats and Republicans have been in the White House and have been complicit and have uplifted, if anything, um, the the idea, the the narrative that you know, oh, these police officers feared for their life, you know, as a justification to be able to continue to kill our people. And so it is definitely not a partisan. Um, uh, it's not a partisan position. It, it, it's it's the position of the ruling class. Is the position of of those that are there to protect and promote um, the ideologies and the practices of a ruling class that has been been in power in a dictatorship in this country for too long. And you know, I think it's important to remember. And I and I, I you know have talked to folks with folks about this. Obama was in power when Mike Brown was killed. Exactly. And he was a black president <laughs> who supposedly came from community organizing, you know, um, with immigrant parents, like all these different ideas of what could potentially make a president that is for the people was shattered right. for, for a lot of young people in this country, you know, by a man who held the power to be able to bring these murderers to justice. Um, and didn't. He was complicit in that. And so I think it's important to remember that and to remember, you know, that in this election year, um, and even as as we talk about, you know, the anti-Trump movement, the anti-Trump movement in the United States is not um, homogeneous. Like, it's not, <laughs> they're all not the same. You know, there are folks that are anti-Trump that are dem Democrats. There are folks that are anti-Trump that are very much you know for capitalism and for continuing to uphold the status quo and we need to be clear of that so our our fight against police brutality against you know white supremacy needs to be paired and rooted uh very well grounded in an anti-capitalist anti-imperialist anti-patriarchal anti-white supremacy um line we need to be really, really clear, really, really careful that this is not a partisan issue. This is a rich, an issue of class. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Claudia, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah,